tanks, a symbol of strength and fighting power, terrifying and destructive. Just because something's scary doesn't mean you can't be interested in it. Sometimes evil is particularly attractive. Hardly any other invention has influenced warfare in the 20th century as much as the tank. It has decided battles and changed the psychology of war. There is nothing like a tank that you meet in civilian life. Its real purpose is there as a killing machine. Used against their own people, they became tools of oppression. When technology and violence come together, they have a very attractive mixture for pop culture, for things like model making, for leisure activities. Has the weapon of the century lost its significance today? What role does the tank play in the 21st century? The tank was first used in war at the beginning of the 20th century as a revolutionary weapon. The steel companions were awkward and easily vulnerable. In the Second World War, countries produced more and more powerful tanks. Firepower, mobility and armor increased. Today, modern battle tanks are a high-tech weapon. The tank is really in its infancy in the First World War experimented with in the 1920s and 30s, it shows its full potential in World War II when you've got the idea of not just large numbers of tanks but being used imaginatively to capture ground speedily, cross ground as well that normal infantry would take a long time to get there. Suddenly now we've got something much more effective but doing a similar sort of role and we can do even more with it. 60 kilometers south of Berlin, near Gut Kummersdorf, lies an almost secret place in the Märkische Forest. It is the army test facility Kummersdorf. Two world wars were prepared from here. Rockets, ammunition and tanks were all tested on the site. And in this assembly hall, Hitler's last wonder weapon was to be assembled. The world's heaviest ever tank, with the codename Maus. Weight, 188 tons, over 10 meters long, 3.7 meters wide, and designed for a crew of six. The Panzerkampfwagen 8 was more of a fortress than a tank. 150 of the so-called Maus were built. The area is still secret today. Only those who have a legitimate interest in research, such as military historian Markus Pöhlmann, can enter the site. The hall here is actually intended for dismantling and assembling this vehicle in trial operations. You have to understand that it weighs almost 190 tons. The turret alone is so heavy that you can't lift it with a normal truck-mounted crane, so you need technicians and equipment familiar with ship bridge construction from a shipyard, and for this you need a hall that can even house such a crane. In January of 1943, Hitler awarded the design contract to Ferdinand Porsche. By May the 1st, he was able to show him a wooden model of the mouse. The weight of the tank had increased so much due to the 220 mm thickness of reinforced armor that it could only be driven using a 1,080 horsepower engine. Maximum speed, 13 kilometers an hour. Built by Alket in Berlin, the mouse was taken by train to Kummersdorf for testing. The turret was to be built here in the assembly hall. Its weight alone was 55 tons. The hall itself was never finished. 
In 1944, all orders for the construction of super heavy tanks were discontinued. For this vehicle, every river crossing was an obstacle because no bridge could sustain its weight, so they had to disassemble it and bring it to the combat area where they could quickly reassemble and deploy it. But an immobile tank may not be a tank at all. The Maushalle, the Maus Hall, is not the only ruin at the Kummersdorf site. A good 4,000 other buildings are located in the entire area. Another one in the immediate vicinity of the Maushalle is the so-called Klimahalle. Here, vehicles were exposed to extreme climatic conditions. Temperatures of minus 20 degrees Celsius were generated in the hall. And in the dust chamber, temperatures reached over 40 plus degrees. A war where you want to achieve world domination usually takes place in several climate zones. The dangers for the tank are dust. Of course, this is always a problem for the carburetor. It's also problematic for the drive, the track. You have to be able to simulate these climate conditions in order to make the vehicle suitable for war. When the Eastern Front Line reached Berlin in the spring of 1945, the Wehrmacht blew up the two prototype tanks. The Red Army captured the racks and used the remains to construct a new mouse. This one-of-a-kind prototype of the super tank is now in the Kubinka Museum near Moscow. In 1944, the Allies prepared for their offensive in Normandy. Large quantities of troops, weapons and supplies were concentrated there. The further the Allies pushed the Hitler's troops back, the more the Wehrmacht had to deal with the US M4 Sherman tank. A large-scale model which included parts from US automobile production. Together with the T-34, it is the most built tank of the Second World War. Compared to the heavy German tanks, the US tank made up for its weaknesses with a high production rate and ease of repair and maintenance. The sheer mass of American combat vehicles impressed the enemy. that symbolic power of the tank is more than just what it does on the battlefield. It's a fact it looks like it's industrial might, it looks like power, and there's very little you can do against it. And from the first day it appears, the tank, that sense of just its sheer presence can dominate an enemy or make him decide that's the moment I'm going to give up. The German leadership had not considered giving up until the end. Although the armaments industry could barely keep up with demand, the production of Panzerfaust ran at full speed until the end. In the last four months of the war alone, two million of them were made, a deadly threat to Allied tanks. German reserves march on. Equipped with all weapons, they move into their locations. In deployments, the men wait with the bazooka. The deadly enemies of the American Sherman tanks are the Panzerfaust Grenadiers. That's how they use their weapons. And that's how they work. It always looks the same when rocket shells of the anti-tank weapons have torn steel walls apart. But for the American Shermans, it is not all resistance that they run into. For the oppressed of war, 
the tank becomes a liberator. If you're being liberated by a tank, you've got very different attitudes to that vehicle if it's freeing you from oppression. So you can look at a tank in very different ways depending on how it's being used uh, and what circumstance you particularly are in at that time. If you look at tanks going through Europe, liberating France, Belgium, um, everyone comes out, they write their names on the side of the tank. They, they don't look at them as being a weapon of oppression. They see them as a symbol of liberation. So again, you see, we can, we can see the same item depending on how, what end of the barrel you're at sometimes, if you see what I mean. You know, that can give you a very different impression. This might be the thing that freed my country, or it might be the thing that parks on the front lawn um, that oppresses me. The invention of the atomic bomb represented a turning point in warfare. The Americans in particular neglected the further development of their tanks in favor of the new nuclear weapon. In Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the US destroyed the lives of hundreds of thousands of people by dropping the bomb. The age of the atomic bomb was a real challenge for the tank for a long time. The big turning point in the Cold War for the tank came with MAD, that is Mutual Assured Destruction. At that moment, when mutual annihilation was assured, both sides were thinking, well, now we could reactivate other options again. We do not want a total nuclear war, so we'll allow smaller outsourced conflicts. These famous proxy wars, and even if it escalates in Europe, then we do that in stages, before we reach for the big red button. And that's how the tank became important again, because as a modern means of combat, it was the chief weapon after the Second World War, which would continue to spearhead conventional wars. In the Korean War between 1950 and 53, the tank again proved its military value. The US realized that they still needed tanks. Similar to divided Germany, Korea was also under the rule of the superpowers US and Soviet Union after the Second World War. It was divided into South and North Korea, which fought continuously at the border. The national conflict developed into an international proxy war. The Americans sent the powerful M46 Patton into battle. There's still that issue about when you're driving down the road. The Americans, for example, they paint great big tiger teeth, a face on the front of their tank because, again, they're trying to show to the cow, local population or people that might be against it, this is something big and powerful. After three years of bloody fighting, the war ended with a ceasefire and the division of Korea. The Korean War was a kind of saving grace for the tank, even though it hadn't played a major role in recent years, and that's because the atomic bomb could not be used in Korea due to the lack of large settlements and industrial areas. Fortunately, the Americans certainly thought about doing so, but there were simply no objectives, and so as early as 1950, when the atomic bomb seemed to be the panacea for many military conflicts, it was already clear, no, it isn't always. And that saved the tank again over time, so to speak. Almost at the same time the Korean War hadn't ended, a popular uprising threatened the Soviet-occupied part of Berlin. With a general strike, the citizens of the GDR protested against the increase of the labor norm. On June 17, 1953, they took to the streets in Berlin and more than 700 other towns and municipalities to protest against the SED regime. They still had no idea that here too, eight years after the end of the war, the tank would play a role again. Tanks where we see them on the streets being used against their own population, that sense of the tank becoming a symbol of an authoritarian power, it's kind of the ultimate symbol that um, uh, a government can use against its own people. You've crossed a line if you use your tank against your own people. Among the demonstrators in Berlin was Joachim Rudolf, who was 14 years old. The last time he had seen tanks was at the end of the war. Joachim Rudolf was a pupil in eighth grade. 
He was not in school on June the 17th, 1953. In the evening, he heard on Westrundfunk radio about a large-scale demonstration planned for East Berlin. Rudolf arranged to meet a school friend. They wanted to watch the protests together. Of course, we were very curious about how this would take place and what would happen in the city that day, because nobody could have imagined that's what none of us had experienced. There was a huge hello with the people. They were so happy, they clapped their hands and shouted hurrah and so on. And that infected everyone. We were part of that crowd that was on Marx Engels Square and we thought and felt the same as the other workers and employees. But soon the mood changed. There were calls for free elections. The legitimacy of the SED regime was called into question. The demonstrators broke into the offices of the People's Police and destroyed files. The People's Police were completely overwhelmed. 20,000 Soviet soldiers were deployed for support. There was a dull droning from one side, from the direction of Alexanderplatz, from Rathausstrasse, and suddenly there was screaming, get out, the tanks are coming, the Russians are coming. And at that moment, the first tank came around the corner. It made a hell of a noise. The tanks drove past the Red City Hall to Marx Engelsplatz and then turned right and drove into the crowd standing on Marx Engelsplatz. The demonstrators were powerless against the military. Although the tanks didn't shoot into the crowd, 55 people died as a result of the protests. Here in front, in front of the present new palace building, stood a wooden grandstand, which was later replaced by the Palace of the Republic in the GDR. And as these tanks turned around the corner, a panic rose among the people, who naturally tried to get out of the way of the tanks as quickly as possible. And I was standing in a larger group, fleeing up to the wooden grandstand to get out of the way and make room. And that's when I got lucky, because the tanks drove past us and I didn't experience them anymore. And then I tried to go home as soon as possible, because my mother was of course also afraid, and I was also very afraid. I was 14 years old on that day, and I had not seen any tanks at all since 1945, and that was a very lasting and shocking impression for me. The T-34 tanks of the Soviet Memorial stand for the liberation of Berlin in 1945. For Joachim Rudolf, it's also a reminder of June the 17th, 1953. It was exactly this type, with huge noise caused by the tank engines, huge clouds of smoke coming out of the exhaust pipes. It was exactly this type of tank. It remained in our memory as an object of oppression. Especially in the Western world, it was, of course, an instrument of the Eastern regime, of the Soviets. Prague, 1968. Once again, tanks rolled across the streets of a capital city, surrounded by people who had taken to the streets with their dreams of freedom. It was the night of August 20th. The tanks were part of one of the largest demonstrations of military power in Europe since the end of the Second World War. Soviet soldiers were there to stop the Prague Spring, the liberal reform movement of a socialist brother state. By the end of the year, 108 people were dead as a result of the brutal military operation. More than 500 were injured. The tanks destroyed the dream of an entire generation by force. 
The tank can have a high symbolic value in various contexts, be it for the motivation of one's own people or for oppression, for frightening the opponent, because unlike aeroplanes and submarines, it takes place in one's own reality. One is on the same boat as the observer. The plane is always far away. You can imagine a bomb or something, but that's theoretical. The sub might be in the dock or somewhere else, but the tank stands in front of you, and it can also be standing where you are standing in the next moment. It can roll over you. It can take your place. It's next to you in the same world. Beijing, June the 5th, 1989. Tanks had bloodily crashed. The peaceful civil protests on Tiananmen Square when suddenly a man with shopping bags stood in their way. famous Tiananmen Square imagery is so powerful because it's one person being brave enough to stand up to something we all know is big, frightening, powerful, could so easily crush him. And what you actually see is a person being brave enough to try and contact the crew inside so there's a human face talking to a human face. Who was the man who so courageously stood in front of the steel behemoths? His fate is still unknown today, but the images of the tank man went around the world and became an iconic symbol of resistance. When the tank is not being used on the battlefield and is not on maneuvers, its third role is usually that of a symbol of state power, and most of the time that's what's being interpreted or expressed in parades. The symbolic power of the tanks, their deterrence, had to be demonstrated especially during the Cold War. Military parades were a part of the standard repertoire of socialist countries in particular. Moscow traditionally celebrated its victory over Nazi Germany in front of state guests and World War veterans. But tank parades were also a popular means of demonstrating strength among the Allies in Berlin or the rulers in Beijing. It is this mechanical impression that the parade provides, as if to say, look, this is what this regime, this government, this nation, this army can do. And that is precisely what it was meant to do in the old Eastern Bloc states and in all authoritarian systems. It is quite often a clear warning to all opponents. It doesn't matter whether they're external or internal. It is not only in authoritarian states where rulers show off their military arsenal in parades. The French traditionally celebrate their national holiday with a military parade on the Champs-Élysées. C'est une image de force. That's a very clear picture of strength. The heavy tanks, like the Leclerc, are designs from the 80s. At that time, the Cold War still existed. It had a clear psychological aspect. When you see a steel monster coming towards you, it's always much more frightening than if it were just a small vehicle. It was the same in the GDR, which had a comparatively small tank army. Even there, the tanks traditionally rolled on the day of the Republic. Tanks have been bought by countries that can't maintain them or can't even use them effectively, but they were part of that propaganda. Look, we're the guys with the big stick. From France, General Eisenhower went to the Great Autumn Maneuvers in northern Germany, in which British Field Marshal Montgomery also took part. Troops from the US, France, Holland, Denmark, Norway and Belgium were also involved in these British maneuvers. Thus, through such military unions and joint exercises, Europe will be strengthened more and more against any aggression. Since the end of the 1950s, the Federal Republic of Germany had regularly been the scene of major military exercises each autumn by the Western Allies. Their tanks were stationed in Germany. They were maintained all year round and only had to roll onto the roads at the beginning of the maneuver. Yeah. 
If the Cold War had become hot, it was always clear that Germany would be the first main battlefield. The American divisions lived and practiced in America, but they had an entire second set of equipment in Germany. In the event of a crisis, and this was practiced in the reforger exercises, the Americans, only the soldiers really, the soldiers would have gotten onto planes and ships, would have come directly to Europe and found everything ready here. And that worked surprisingly well. And that's why tanks always had a readiness level of over 98%. From the beginning, the NATO maneuvers included German participation. The Bundeswehr not only provided soldiers, but also had its own equipment. In this scenario, West Germany was of crucial importance for NATO. The country itself was very small, so it could be overrun quickly. That meant the fight would be going on on this battlefield in any event. For the battle to be won successfully, the power of Germany also had to be tapped. And that is why NATO and the political decision makers of Western Europe allowed Germany to build tanks again relatively early on. The only reason was the threat, the perceived threat, the perceived threat from the East with the rearming of the Bundeswehr, tanks were again being built in Germany. The Leopard main battle tank, a powerful vehicle, more than two Volkswagen, wide and long. Unloaded weight, almost 37 tons, which is equal to the weight of 43 Volkswagens. Lightweight sheet metal here, strong armor plating here, turning radius of the Volkswagen, 9 meters 60. Turning radius equals vehicle length. Climbing is difficult for this one. but not for that one. Climbing ability, 40% for the Volkswagen, 60% for the Leopard. Our two unequal brethren in a meter and a half of water. And at two meters, 25. And when everyone else has to swim, the leopard rolls and rolls underwater and reappears. The Leopard 1, or Leopard 1, was introduced in the summer of 1963. Rheinmetall, Wegmann and Porsche are all involved. In 1979, its successor, the Leopard 2, went into production. Both were successful models that quickly became export hits. They proved to be powerful, mobile, fast and agile. The designers of the Leopard made a decision. We are fully committed to speed and firepower. We deliberately neglected protection. The logic at the time was that the Leopard was built or was developed in the early 60s when there were so-called hollow charges. Hollow charges are projectiles of a certain type which were actually able to penetrate armor of any thickness at that time. And that's why the Germans decided it doesn't matter, we won't even try to build even thicker armor. We prefer to build a vehicle that is so fast and so agile that it won't get hit in the first place. And then we'll put a reasonable cannon on it so that it can knock out the enemy. That was the principle principle and that worked very well. And so the Leopard 1 became a very successful tank. Tank Battalion Munster in the Lüneburg Heath. More than 40 years later, the Leopard is still the main tank of instruction for the Bundeswehr. That's the Leopard 2A4 instruction tank. That is the turret, so it's almost all the same. The body is the same, the weight classes are the same, the dimensions are the same. That's why we've got this dummy barrel here too, so that the students learn how to handle the dimensions in the field. 
Here in front, where the driver's seat would be, what we've done here now is an angled mirror on the left over which the driver would then observe the left area in the terrain. The hatch is now open. That is to say, here you would now see the middle angled mirror and the right angled mirror. And up there we have our driving controls, where I can override the student driver. Before they go out on the track in a real tank, the soldiers practice in the tank simulator. Comrade Kurler, today is your third day and third lesson in the simulator. Today you'll drive off-road, and after safety checks, I'll close the door. The controls in the simulator are identical to those of the tank. The main thing here is to learn the technical details and how to handle the tank. Driver, your commander, how do you read me? I read you well, how do you read me? I read you loud and clear. Driver, off-road readiness. Driver, forward march. So now we already have the first basic job, namely driving over bumps. When we drive down, accelerate, 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 accelerate. Stay on the gas, release the throttle at the top for a moment, and then accelerate again. No, that has to be a flowing movement. More gas now. As we stand on a gradient, more gas. Exactly. Now stay on the gas, stay on the gas, take off and accelerate again. The most difficult thing for the student driver in the beginning is really that he has a lot coming at him. That is, he has to drive completely differently. He has to touch different things. He also has to make a report. He has to ask whether the danger area is clear before starting off. So there is a lot of input in the beginning that the student has to absorb, and then he has to process that. And therefore we have the simulator lessons. A student driver is taking the Leopard 2 off-road today. The soldier is about to take her exam and will have to practice standard situations again. In the terrain, the driver sits under a closed hatch and can only orientate herself via periscope-like window slits, the so-called angle mirrors. The hardest part of driving a tank like this is really because of the angular mirrors, because you only have a small field of vision, which means you have to cover the whole thing. You might also have blind spots to the front. You'll see the bumps, but they come later, so now you really have to put everything together, which is what I see, what I feel, and then the feedback from the vehicle. You really have to concentrate, because there are so many differences to a car. And the weight of 50 tons and 1,500 horsepower also make a substantial difference. I have no problem with narrowness at all, with the angle mirrors. You just have to get used to it. It distorts the real picture a bit. You don't perceive nature that much anymore. You can't see. You go down the hill right now, you only see the sky. But otherwise, you get used to it pretty quickly. The German tank museum in Münster is located in the immediate vicinity of the barracks. Christian Barth is a hobby commander and passionate tank fan. As a volunteer, he is in charge of the Leopard 1 main battle tank in the museum. Once a month, he takes a look at the almost 40-year-old steel giant and checks to see whether the engine is still running. In addition to the powerful cannon, the museum Leopard is equipped with two machine guns. 
fires standard NATO ammunition and takes two types of ammunition. One is the multi-purpose projectile, which is in principle a hollow charge projectile like that of a Panzerfaust III, which is currently in the Bundeswehr, or I can shoot a kinetic balancing projectile, which is a so-called tungsten arrow, called penetrator, which is simply there to penetrate the armor. Across the street, two colleagues are taking care of an exhibit from Bundeswehr stocks, a Marder infantry fighting vehicle. Lutz Schulze and Michael Hohmeyer are a well-rehearsed team. The two come to Munster regularly to dedicate themselves to the preservation of the Oldtimer. For a long time, the Marder was the main weapon system of the Panzergrenadiertruppe. There is room for up to seven men plus crew in the infantry fighting vehicle. Actually, I've been interested in the Marder since my military service, and it's amazing that you can achieve a lot with a little. It's kind of like a steam locomotive where you can still understand the technology. It's not yet completely automated or digitized like some other combat vehicles in the Bundeswehr. There's still a lot of handiwork involved. The Marder is the first infantry fighting vehicle built in Germany after the Second World War. Protecting the exhibit from damage is one of the tasks of the technically inclined hobby mechanics. Okay, now here I open the engine room hatch, because when we are here every four weeks, we do an engine room check, because we never know what will happen in the long run when we are not here. There can always be some kind of damage, static damage or condensation, or some hoses become leaky or something else. OK, the engine compartment is in order, and now we can start the vehicle. And we do that so that the engine oil flows, so that the engine gets warm, and so that everything moves. The 600 horsepower engine starts without a murmur. The regular maintenance was worth it. Moscow at the end of the 1980s. In the second half of the 80s, there were signs of change in the Soviet Union. The dissatisfaction of the people grew. There were increasingly large shortages of everything for the people. The planned economy, strict command structures and rampant military expenditure weakened the economy of the superpower more and more. President Gorbachev, who came to power in 1985, wanted to change all that. With Glasnost and Perestroika, he wanted to open the economy to private initiatives and involve the population in the political decision-making processes. For decades, arms expenditure had consumed up to a quarter of the Soviet gross national product every year. But Gorbachev's reforms did not bear the desired fruit. By the end of the 80s, the supply situation in the Soviet Union was still catastrophic. At the same time, more and more constituent republics were striving for autonomy and independence. A new treaty on the Soviet Union, which assured the republics more sovereignty, was a thorn in the side of many party members. On August 19 in 1991, communist hardliners tried to force a coup in Moscow against President Mikhail Gorbachev. Tanks were on the loose in downtown Moscow, but the armed forces refused to follow the coup leaders. The amateurishly organized revolt quickly collapsed. Boris Yeltsin, then president of the Russian Republic, called on the people to resist and prevented the overthrow. At the same time, he secured more power for himself. For Gorbachev and the superpower, this was a downfall. It was the end of several years of decay. One year earlier, the soldiers and tanks of the Soviet army stationed in the GDR withdrew. The Soviet Union had stationed 14,000 tanks in the Warsaw Pact states. Suddenly, they seemed superfluous. 
more than 500,000 people, including war material, left Germany within four years and returned to Russia. The withdrawal was the largest peacetime troop transfer in military history. In the middle of Germany, surrounded by nature parks and agricultural areas, lies the small village of Rockensusra. Europe's largest tank dismantling facility is located in the 200 inhabitant village in the Thuringian province. The last stop for steel giants lined up here for scrapping. More than 500 tanks are waiting to be dismantled in the huge tank cemetery. It takes three to five days to dismantle these behemoths, which can weigh up to 60 tons professionally. In the end, only pieces of between 50 to 100 centimeters remain, which can no longer be assembled. After reunification, Germany had too many tanks. Hundreds of tanks of the former National People's Army were dismantled as part of the agreement. This is easy. This is where we empty the fuel. Between 300 and 600 liters, the lifeblood of the vehicle. I'm not really sorry about the tank anymore, but rather the money they once cost. After all, there's quite a fortune in a tank like that. The technology, I don't want to know what that amounts to. The employees have dismantled around 18,000 armored vehicles since 1991. The different metals are neatly separated from each other. What's left is a pile of metal. In Rockensusra, the tank offers a sad picture, the end of the weapon of the century. The tank came onto the battlefield in 1916 and was already declared obsolete by many people in 1918. It was declared obsolete when the atomic bomb arrived, when suddenly there were the anti-tank guided missiles that the individual soldier could carry. It was declared obsolete in 1990 because the Cold War was over. So what purpose did tanks still serve? The tank was said to be dead every few years, but it didn't disappear. The conflicts of today demonstrate that tanks will not disappear that quickly. Since the outbreak of the Ukraine conflict, it is not just the Baltic EU states that feel threatened by Moscow. In a NATO report classified as secret, the military expressed doubts as to whether the alliance could react quickly enough to a Russian surprise attack. We only have to see in our current times this rebirth of almost a Cold War again has meant that countries that have disposed of their tanks, for example, the Netherlands got rid of all its tanks, they're now hiring tanks back in. Uh, Canada did the same thing. So countries are actually reinvigorating their tank programs when not that long ago we thought this was done and dusted. The conflicts of the 21st century have also changed the tank. Smaller and modular in design, it has adapted to its new fields of application, like here in Syria. At the same time, the vulnerabilities of the heavy tanks became apparent when they were deployed in urban environments. Statically positioned without support in a unit, they easily become targets themselves.
IS fighters allegedly destroyed Turkish armed forces Leopard tanks for the first time. The German flagship tank was previously considered indestructible. If you look at the war in Syria, if you look at the war in Ukraine, then of course you can imagine situations where you say tanks still play a role in the future. Except that they'll play a completely different role in a digitized battlefield, which will look very different to what we have today and what we had in World War II. Paris. In the north of the French capital, just a few minutes from Charles de Gaulle Airport, lies the Villepinte Exhibition Centre. The Eurosatery takes place here every two years, the world's most important military trade fair for the defence industry. Over 1,000 exhibitors from around 60 countries present their war material here. There's more armament in the world now than there has been since the Cold War. Last year alone, countries globally spent 1.43 trillion euros on armaments, first and foremost from the US and China. The hot conflicts of the present heat up the arms spiral. But it's not just about military strength. The arms industry guarantees billion dollar business. Politics and business are closely interlinked. French Secretary of Defense, Florence Parly. The people know each other from the interlinked web of politics, business and the military. Rheinmetall CEO Armin Pappberger presents the latest product from the German tank manufacturer. Rheinmetall has a very proud history as a market innovator and we constantly reinvest to develop new and very innovative products to solve the problems that our customers face on the battlefield of today and of tomorrow. A world premiere for a new generation of battle tanks. The in-house advertising clip documents the self-confidence of the armaments maker. In 2017, Rheinmetall generated sales of 5.9 billion euros with its products. A reason to celebrate as defense budgets continue to rise worldwide. But what role will the tank play in the future? Asking the question what is the role of the tank today is actually wrong. The tank has many different roles. If they are sitting somewhere in the Congo and there's a warlord who has a Colton mine, he only needs one T-54 to rule the region. Because if the people who live here don't have a bazooka, an RPG or anything else, then this one ancient Soviet tank is a massive force. There probably won't be any more large tank battles. That's what we always think of, World War II, the Cold War. But as I said, depending on the scenario, a few tanks are still enough. That is the crucial question. Will the tank of the future be like we know it today? Shouldn't another weapons system perhaps replace the tank? I don't have an answer yet. Perhaps the tank of the future will have a completely different shape. Maybe it won't exist anymore. But in any case, there must be a weapons system that allows us to move, shoot and hit the target. 
Does modern warfare still need tanks? Or has modern warfare long since shifted to cyberspace, where digital societies are most vulnerable? The symbolic power of the tank, its power as a killing machine, but also its fascinating technology have preoccupied people since its inception. The tank has shaped our image of war. After every conflict, it was declared dead. And yet, it emerged stronger and stronger from the crisis. It was born in the First World War. And its development isn't finished, not even after 100 years.